Hello, and welcome to the final section of this course, where we will look at no pattern or anti patterns. This will help us to see how the patterns that we have covered in the past few sections are really useful by showing some of the problems that you can get into by not following them when appropriate. In this section, we're going to be looking at the following anti patterns, starting with spaghetti code, followed by blob, functional decomposition, and finally, copy and paste programming. In this first video, we'll look at spaghetti code. We will cover what this anti-pattern is, symptoms, consequences, and causes of it, example of spaghetti code and how it might be improved, and how to prevent spaghetti code. Spaghetti code is when program flow is twisted and tangled like spaghetti. Typically, this used to refer to lots of go-to statements in BASIC, which made the code very difficult to follow, as you literally had to jump around a lot to try and follow a procedure. Now, this specific problem is obviously less likely in Python, but spaghetti code can more generally refer to hard-to-follow, ill-structured code, and this is definitely something that can still happen in Python, as we'll see in our example. So what are the symptoms of spaghetti code? Well, as mentioned, it's code that can have very little structure. It can be hard to understand, even to the original developer. It tends to be very process oriented Where there are objects, there tends to be a small number of them with very large methods and multiple responsibilities. There's often minimal relationship between objects, and the pattern of object use tends to be very predictable. So what are the consequences of these? Well, it can make code difficult to extend or reuse, and this means that software can quickly reach a point of diminishing returns, where the effort involved in maintaining an existing code base is greater than the cost of developing a new one. Flow of execution is often determined by object implementation and not the client, which means the client has less flexibility and benefits of OO tend to be lost. So what causes spaghetti code? Often it can be caused by inexperience with or lack of understanding of object-oriented programming. Working in isolation, where you don't have anyone to bounce ideas off or check if something is a good idea. Ineffective code reviews, or lack of design before implementation. And in fact, these are typical causes of most anti-patterns. So let's have a look at an example of spaghetti code. Now, for the purpose of this video, this is quite a small example. So with spaghetti code, sort of the longer and more vast the code is, the more spaghetti it tends to be. So this is not the worst example of spaghetti code, but it highlights some of the code smells that might indicate spaghetti code. So in this case, we have a function to play blackjack. Now, it starts by initialising some variables and creates a deck of cards. And this is what it does up to line 26. After this point, we then set up a hand of two cards for each, the player and the dealer. Now, there's a few things to notice about this. First of all, it's a completely separate responsibility from creating a deck of cards, but it lives in the same function. Secondly, you can see that we have these comments above each step explaining what the step is doing. And that's a bad sign because typically code should be self-documenting. So really, ideally, you'd have one function which has one responsibility and the function is well named enough that you can tell what it's doing just by looking at the name of that function. And then thirdly, you can see between line 29 and line 36, we're actually duplicating a lot of code here because the setup for setting up a hand for the player and the dealer is actually exactly the same. So after this, we then have the player and the dealer each make a hit or stand decision. Again, this function could be separate from the previous actions because it's a separate responsibility. And again, we see the code been duplicated for the player and the dealer. The other thing to notice is that this is a fairly long function that's completely procedural and there's no use of objects anywhere. So how could we improve this? But I would like you to think about how you could do it as an extension of this video. One useful place to start could be to identify potential objects. For example, if we go back to the top where we're creating our deck of cards, you can see that maybe the deck of cards could be an object that would represent the deck and hold the state of that deck throughout play. And then after this point, our dealer and our player, or our gambler, comes into play. So we could have a dealer and a gambler object. And as we've noticed, they draw and play in pretty much the same way. So actually, we could have a player base class uh, from which they inherit, and that could have methods like draw hand and hit or stand, and a reference to the current hand. So you can see how that structuring the code in that way would make it easier to understand because it encapsulates each distinct entity and responsibility, and it would also avoid code duplication because you could put common code on the base class. 
Okay, so now that we've looked at what spaghetti code is, let's have a quick look at how you might be able to prevent it. Well, first of all, Python has meaningful indentation, and this should help because you should visually be able to see when you might have a very long function or a very long piece of procedural code with no class declarations in it. Even this should work alongside um, just keeping in mind that you should be avoiding large multi-responsibilities, classes or methods. It can be really useful to ask someone unfamiliar with the code to read it and see if they can easily understand its intention. And if not, that could be an indication that your code is too complex or hard to understand. And finally, it always helps to spend a good amount of time designing before implementation.